Lovely. Um, and while we're presenting, we'll have about 30 minutes or so in which we tell you about the project. Um, we appreciate that you can keep your mics muted during this time. And then afterwards, we'll open the floor to questions both in person and online. So please show us your lovely faces and unmute yourselves at that time. Um, right. So a brief background on the project. It was funded by the Cambridge Conservation Initiative and included Fauna and Flora, BirdLife International, UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Centre and the University of Cambridge Zoology Department, all of whom brought a unique set of skills and experiences to the project. The project's titled Defining and Measuring Destructive Fishing in Support of Achieving SDG 14, Life Below Water, and the outcome of the project was to develop a greater shared understanding of what destructive fishing is and the problems it causes, thereby informing better marine management. We wanted to show you who the gang are who've created I, I, this project. I so finish it. It's really a lot of us, so we I, can't I'm see. Capanians, I'm going to. Yes, I'm sending this thing to Lita. There's quite a lot of people involved there. Um, and we thank all of them for their incredible contributions. Media letters I require, so I don't have any excuse now. Okay. So, why destructive fishing? Yeah, I think I need a picture. Um, but target have... 14.4 of the UN Sustainable I Development Goals included a specific aim to end overfishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, and destructive fishing practices. As you can see, while there were indicators included in these sustainable development goals for overfishing and illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, this was not the case for destructive fishing. This created a vacuum and United Nations member states who are all signatories to the sustainable development goals lacked clarity of the action required to end destructive fishing practices. <laughs> The term continues to be widely used um, with reference to deep concern. Well, as you can see on this timeline, it's been widely used since 1995, um, all the way up to the SDGs. And since then, it's been used in other policy documents, including a 2020 IUCN resolution focused on reducing the impact of fisheries on marine biodiversity, where it noted deep concern about the high incidence of destructive fishing um, and other threats to the ocean. Um, so it's a really very widely used term. And again, it's pretty poorly defined in a lot of these um, policy documents. We wanted in the first stage of our research to investigate what kind of definitions were present for um, the term and did a systematic review of the use of the term in three record types, academic literature, media articles, and policy documents between 1976 and 2020. The analysis was performed on a subset of records which were gained from a number of different origins and considered the extent to which the term is characterized in terms of what's included um, under the term. Um, the geographic distribution of use of the term and specific impacts and practices associated with the term. Um, I'm just going to share a few key findings from this initial background research. Um, found that the use of the term destructive fishing relative to the generic term fisheries has increased since the 1990s, that the term was characterized in detail and only 15% of records, thereby showing that it's really not very well defined at all, that habitat damage and blast and poison fishing were the most associated ecological impacts and gears and practices, um, while bottom trawling and unspecified net fishing were also regularly linked to the concept of destructive fishing. Um, Furthermore, there was significant regional variation on how the term is used, and there were differences in how each of the three record types, the media articles, the academic literature, 
and the policy documents used the term. For example, academic literature tended to specifically articulate negative impacts, while media articles focus generally on the associated gears and practices. This understanding of the terms used to date allowed us to embark on the next stage of the project. And I'll hand over now to Ali, who will discuss our work to define destructive fishing. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jack. So for this part of the project, we embarked on a, an expert uh, consultation process. And broadly speaking, we use the Delphi-based technique and we consulted experts with broadly within the field of fisheries uh, to try and identify areas of consensus or divergent, divergence in what they thought destructive fishing actually meant. And we wanted to also tease out how destructive fishing might relate to other existing fisheries terms or concepts, some of which are perhaps already uh, better defined and in use. And we were also aware that um, it's a fairly um, controversial or loaded term in some areas, and we wanted to examine if any of the differences we found in the ways people were considering the term destructive fishing were actually related to the sector that they worked in. So an overview of the Delphi process that we use, it's an iterative process and we used three rounds of an online survey. And when I mean iterative, I mean that the results of each round informed what we asked in the next one. And also that in between rounds, we gave feedback to all the participants, um, both reminding them of how they answered um, our questions in that round, but also putting that in the context of how the rest of the group responded. But importantly, this was uh, anonymous, so no one could say, oh, that person from that place over there said X, Y, Z. Uh, and after these three rounds of uh, online surveys, we also held a workshop. So who, who were our experts? Um, we shared the survey with a lot of uh, larger sort of fisheries management bodies that and representative organizations that represented a whole range of um, different organization, uh, companies, governments, and they snowballed that out to their members. And that meant that within our respondents, we had people from seafood sector corporates, intergovernmental bodies, academic institutions, uh, civil society organizations, as well as small scale fisheries bodies. So we had quite a range within the 80 respondents that we got from the first round. And these, had, these respondents had um, on average 21 years experience working within uh, the broad field of fisheries. So they, we were confident that they really were experts. And for round two, we had 54 respondents and then 42 respondents for the third round. We did have respondents from quite a wide range of countries. So you can see many countries represented. We did have uh, more respondents from the UK and it was um, sort of unfortunate that we didn't also have respondents from some very large fisheries nations, you know, such as Russia or China, or, you know, many parts of Africa where fishery is also really important. Um, and the, just um, as an additional thing, we did also distribute the survey uh, in French and Spanish in addition to English to try and ensure that um, more people were able to answer in a language they felt comfortable answering in. And like I said, we had respondents from quite a range of industries with quite a lot of experience, but um, we did find that civil society and particularly environmental NGOs were particularly well reflected uh, in, um, in our respondent pool, though, as I said, we did have quite a range. So in round one, we, we asked a lot of really open-ended questions, just trying to get people to put down their thoughts on what they felt destructive fishing meant. And we started off by asking 
if they thought an improved definition would be useful. Because if an improved de definition wouldn't actually be useful, then we don't need to um, pursue mm. trying to get one. Um, but most respondents felt that it would be. So it probably is a worthwhile endeavor to try and seek um, either a, a definition or at least come to a shared understanding of what people think it means. And one of a couple of the benefits um, were that it could improve consistency and clarity in how the term is used, but also contribute to a more meaningful implementation of some of the, the global goals like the SDGs. And by asking what experts felt the term destructive fishing means, we were actually able to draw out a number of key concepts that kept popping up in responses. And some of the most um, common ones were this idea of uh, irrecoverability or that it's transformative and long lasting but also this idea of context dependence. So something isn't, or a particular practice isn't always destructive in all contexts. And maybe this is actually where some of the ambiguity of the term and potentially some disagreements might come from. We also asked what impacts they associate most with the term. And these broadly fell into environmental or ecological impacts, social impacts, as well as economic impacts. And these concepts from earlier and also these impacts were what we used to really form the basis of the second round of our survey. And in the second round, and also in the third round, we asked um, respondents to uh, assess statements about destructive fishing on a Likert scale um, from uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And these were around the concept of destructive fishing. How much is it ecological, social, um, economic, um, and how it relates to or identifying some of those impacts as well that had come through from the first round. Um, teasing out whether they felt it was the same or similar to things like overfishing or IUU fishing. Um, and identifying some of those scopes of practices. And we set a 70% consensus threshold. So this means that if 70% of respondents either strongly or somewhat agreed with a statement, we said that had reached consensus. Equally, if they somewhat or strongly disagreed with the statement, they also had consensus that they disagreed with that. And in the second round, we used also use these statements as a bit of a primer um, for respondents to again come up with their own definition. And the third round was very similar to the second round, except that we only asked the questions that had not reached consensus. So these were the, the areas of contention, I suppose. And we asked those again having given them feedback beforehand about the way they responded to that statement in the second round and also how everyone else um, overall had responded to that statement. And after that, we actually found a lot more, um, a number of these statements had then also reached consensus. So overall, what would we find? I'm sure you appreciate that in a relatively short seminar, we don't have time to go into all the nitty gritty of every statement. But we did uh, conduct a principal components analysis on the qualitative aspects. And we found that broadly speaking, there was no difference between the way respondents from different sectors answered the questions. So there was no clear cut line saying NGOs or academics are saying different things or the fishing industry is saying one thing or another. Broadly speaking, um, there was a um, a lot of overlap in the way people from different sectors uh, was responding to the questions. In round three, when we only had those statements that were uh, had not reached consensus and where there was the most um, disagreement, um, there was potentially some a slight divergence, but again, not it was not clear cut. 
And we actually think that's really encouraging because it means that we, we have some evidence to say that if this goes forward and there is uh, further platforms or discussions where people are attempting uh, to come up with the definition, that there's actually a lot of common ground for people across many sectors uh, to approach the term. And they can go into it knowing that they broadly agree on a lot of things. So areas of consensus that came up from these surveys, and these are some things drawn from the statements we asked and also some from the definitions that the uh, respondents gave. And one of the things that really people could agree on was that it relates, destructive fishing relates to an ecological impact and it relates to habitat degradation. So areas of high consensus were really around the environmental and ecological impacts. Interestingly, respondents um, uh, reach consensus that it's the same as serious or irreversible harm, but also that it was different from IEU and overfishing. There was also um, agreement that there's uh, an inherent aspect to the concept of de destructive fishing, so that some gears or practices are just more destructive than others. However, on the flip side, which at first might seem um, contradictory, they also agreed that all practices can be destructive if poorly managed. And I think this really comes back to the idea of context dependency. So yes, some gears might be considered to be more destructive, but it comes down to the context in which they're used and how they're managed. And there were other areas of agreement on things like um, exceeding biological safe limits or damage to um, important areas, vulnerable, vulnerable marine ecosystems or sensitive seabed habitats. And there was also um, acknowledgement that destructive fishing could cause things like habitat degradation, degradation, ecosystem destruction, again, these real ecological um, aspects, but also that it could cause damage to socioeconomic well-being of marine dependent societies. Um, there might be competition to artisanal or passive gears, could destroy jobs and livelihoods. So there was acknowledgement that social economic aspects could be a part of this, but there was less consensus on those areas in exactly what that might look like compared to the ecological elements. And so at the end of this process, we conducted a workshop and we invited our um, the participants from the three rounds of online surveys to join us. And we also deliberately sought out uh, additional people that were uh, from areas either geographically or um, in terms of the part of the industry or sector they worked in to try and balance out our um, group. And out of the workshop, um, we came and participants came to um, a broad agreement that a definition should include words that relate to ecosystem function. Now that might not be the words ecosystem function, but that there was this sense of agreement that it's more than just one species being overfished or that the destructive could relate to broader impacts than that. But also that it needed a spatiotemporal component. And this is where aspects of long lasting or significant adverse effects were coming in. Now, of course, we didn't have the opportunity or the scope to delve into exactly what that means. And these are still pretty vague terms or broad terms. But this was the uh, general agreement of the, the kind of things that my, our definition should include. And it, there was also a recognition that there are a lot of definitions and uh, frameworks out there and that there might be scope to use existing elements so that um, it's not doubling up on, on work for, for people to actually go ahead and implement uh, what they might be able to do with um, a definition, which Julia will delve into a little bit more um, in just a moment. And also out of the workshop, 
um, it became clear that it might be helpful to have a lot of these fine details to actually be determined at sort of local or regional levels. And this plays back into the idea of destructive fishing having a context dependency element. So this would allow people who would be implementing and trying to reduce destructive fishing uh, to actually determine that at the appropriate level. And these were some concerns raised were the ambiguity of a lot of the terms and that there aren't already agreed indicators, um, which is also hard to have without a definition. So it's also an iterative process. But really importantly, out of the workshop, there wasn't an agreement of, of whether social or economic elements could or should be included. And if even if so, what kind of socioeconomic elements that might take. And I think there's broadly a, an, a growing understanding that um, fisheries is not just biological and ecological, it is very much linked to people and livelihoods and, and societies. And that, but that area, it was not something that we could come out with anything sort of firm or consensus building on, but we think it's really important to take into any um, future work that happens on the topic. But on that note, I'm going to hand over to Julia, who will talk to us about an indicator framework. Hello. So yeah, alongside trying to build consensus around the definition for destructive fishing, this project also aims to start exploring how we can actually measure and monitor it because while there is there has been some progress towards how to monitor some elements um, and targets under SDG 14 such as overfishing there is currently no clear understanding and no agreed um, measurable indicators on how we can track progress towards ending destructive fishing um, despite the fact that we have a target to achieve it so this is largely because as covered this is still a very ambiguous term, but measuring it um, is definitely needed because it would not only help us understand the actual magnitude of the issue, but would also help inform any policies or management practices needed to address the issue. Some of, some of the aspects of destructive fishing that were covered um, by Arlie make it inherently challenging to measure uh, the concept. One of them is that it is the actual impact of a given practice that makes it destructive or not. So we need measures that can causally link an impact um, to a given fishing practice to determine whether it is destructive. And it becomes destructive after a certain threshold. Before that, it might have negative impacts, but these may, for example, be reversible. So we might not think is destructive, but then once it reaches that threshold, it becomes destructive but it is hard to determine where these thresholds are. The second one is that destructive fishing is highly context dependent. So in most cases, we can't say that a given fishing practice will always be destructive because its impacts will depend on the actual ecosystem and context it's happening in. So we need measures that can bring that location specific impact in. So we, as part of the project developed a framework that is a first step towards exploring how we can measure destructive fishing and to operationalize this um, in given local and national contexts. So it's meant to be adaptable um, and it is it presents certain criteria that actors can then adapt to their given context. So it guides the development of a framework to conceptualize and measure destructive fishing. It is not a definitive framework and it will obviously have to be also adapted as the definition for destructive fishing is further refined and according to the specific needs, data availabilities, um, etc. of a given country or location um, or actor. So how was the framework developed? We had one key challenge which is how to measure something that is not defined and that is so complex and so context dependent. So for the complexity, clearly destructive fishing is a concept that's made up of several different elements. So it's impossible to capture it using a single indicator. 
So this framework presents several different elements and criteria under different impact categories that can be used to guide the potential measurement and monitoring of destructive fishing. To tackle the lack of a definition, we drew upon previous efforts to define the concept of destructive fishing. And obviously we heavily drew upon our efforts to um, build consensus around defining destructive fishing, which were covered previously. And in terms of the context dependency, we were trying to um, identify elements of destructive fishing that are broad enough that they can then be refined and adapted to any given local context. So building on the results from the survey and the workshop, we identified two broad impact categories for which um, we recommend uh, different actors measure um, destructive fishing. One is impact on ecosystem structure, which includes habitat degradation, so impacts to the physical um, attributes of a habitat, impacts of species composition, and then impacts on the populations of target and non-target species, and then impacts on ecosystem functions, which include, for example, impacts on food webs. And under these two broad categories, we identified seven elements, and these were elements where there was the where there was consensus, which was that breach of the 70% consensus in the survey that um, we covered before. And for each of these seven elements, we suggest potential monitoring components. So these are actually measurable elements that could help track progress towards minimizing or ending that specific impact of destructive fishing. Um, then for each of those monitoring components, potential data needs for those. And then finally, we identified some example existing indicators which could be candidates for monitoring that monitoring component. And um, we chose to use existing indicators because uh, the idea was to show that measuring destructive fishing is not an additional burden, should not or does not have to be an additional burden and existing indicators under existing monitoring frameworks could be repurposed um, for this. I'll cover this a bit more uh, in the following slide, but I want to stress that this is not a comprehensive review of all potential indicators which could be used to track destructive fishing. It's more of an illustration of potential candidate indicators that could be used um, and that can then be assessed for suitability for uh, measuring destructive fishing. And again, the framework needs to be adapted at national and local context. So the idea is that um, different actors look at these different elements and determine what indicators in their context could be used to measure these different elements specifically. So here are the seven elements. Um, organized into the two impact categories. And as you see, it's heavily pulling from um, the results of the survey. So we have uh, impacts on habitat structure, habitat degradation, and there's these keywords of significantly um, adversely impacting and then long-term um, impacts, which then have to also be defined at the local level because these are vague terms, but for a good reason, because whether something is significantly adversely impacting biological structure will be context dependent. Um, and it's worth mentioning that there was are different levels of agreement for these different elements as well. So for example, some of them are a bit more contentious. Target species um, impacts, for example, have to be clearly differentiated from the concept of overfishing. And the way that experts decided or vaguely agreed uh, to think about this was that it's a destructive impact if fishing makes target species populations go below biologically safe limits, whereas overfishing is more to do with sustainable yields. So that's how it's differentiated. But obviously, these different components might be more or less relevant in different contexts. So again, have to be adapted to local contexts. So, um, because we are repurposing indicators, we proposed within the framework that existing indicators be assessed for feasibility or suitability to measure destructive fishing according to these four different suitability criteria, which are relevance. So how strongly, how strong the scientific evidence is for causally linking 
the what is being measured by this indicator to the actual monitoring component that we're looking at in terms of potentially destructive impacts. Readiness, whether the indicator is ready to use, because one of, some of the illustrative examples that we gave are proposed indicators um, rather than some that are being used by countries currently or some that are um, out of use, for example, as well. Then responsiveness, so how sensitive they are. And finally, resolution in terms of spatial, temporal, and also taxonomic resolution. And here's an example indicator to um, kind of show the kinds of indicators that we were considering as candidates um, for potentially monitoring destructive fishing. And this swept area seabed impact indicator, for example, could look at impacts to uh, seabed, like habitat structure impacts. Um, and we also outlined data needs for each of these. Um, so some key messages and recommendations came through from our work. The first is that, again, this framework should be used to help conceptualize how destructive fishing could be monitored and should be adapted and refined to the local context, including not only the selection of monitoring components and indicators, but also the definition of these terms, such as long-lasting adverse and significant impacts. Also, the monitoring framework, as we've presented it, is quite higher level and is currently mostly addressed towards national policymakers. So the kind of indicators that we selected were based, one, on the kind of indicators that experts in the workshops suggested, but also through a review of indicators that countries are currently using to monitor both um, marine ecosystem, um, marine ecosystem condition and also fishing um, impacts. But whereas we were targeting national um, policymakers, it's still higher level enough that it could potentially also be adapted for different uses, such as by the fishing industry. Then some other key considerations are the setting of thresholds and baselines. This was beyond the scope of what we were trying to achieve here, but obviously once countries choose candidate indicators that are um, suitable for potentially measuring destructive impacts, they will then need to think about setting thresholds and baselines for these indicators. Second, causality and attribution of impact is challenging. Um, and this varies across elements. So for example, for physical seabed impacts, it might be easier to attribute that to a specific fishing practice like trawling. But then when we're looking at impacts on function, that becomes a lot trickier. And kind of linked to that, in some cases, it's going to be impossible to directly measure impacts with the indicators and data that we currently have. So it may be suitable um, to use proxy indicators, which maybe just um, look at the occurrence of a given potentially um, destructive practice over a vulnerable habitat, and then using that as a measure for destructive fishing impacts or maybe just looking at the occurrence of a hazard, for example, for practices, for fishing practices, which we could feasibly say are mostly going to be destructive in all cases, like blast fishing, then that could be used as a proxy indicator for destructive fishing directly. Unsurprisingly, there is important data availability gaps um, for measuring destructive fishing. And the exercise of trying to identify existing indicators that could be used for measuring destructive fishing can inform the identification of these gaps. But from our work, there's a big gap in terms of ecosystem function um, indicators. So while experts did see ecosystem function as an important element to look at when thinking about destructiveness, existing indicators make it a bit challenging to measure um, those impacts right now. And then last but not least, we did not look at economic and social elements because, as was mentioned, there was not enough consensus on exactly how or if they should be included in destructive, you know, destructive fishing definition. But that is not to say that these are not important elements. It's clear that fishing can have potentially destructive impacts on social uh, factors such as livelihoods and um, employment. So when considering how to operationalize or like when refining this framework, we definitely recommend that these elements are considered. And that's it for the monitoring framework. I'll hand over to Hannah for the next steps.
Great, so I just wanted to um, conclude by providing a brief outline of some of our plan next steps um, to try and move some of this research into more sort of practical implementation. Um, so at the moment we are developing a peer review paper. Um, so this is gonna cover the um, expert survey and the workshop, which Ali went over earlier. Um, so we're currently writing that up into a peer review paper. We're also looking to develop a policy brief um, to try and get the sort of um, issue of destructing fish, destructive fishing higher on the agenda at various international policy fora. Um, so at the moment, we're planning on targeting the, the FAO and the Committee on Fisheries as the custodians of SDG 14.4, um, but also looking at the IUCN, which do also have a resolution on destructive fishing. Um, we're looking at supporting local partners to help inform local and national policies um, to address the threat of destructive fishing on the water. And this is something within fauna and flora specifically, we're all sort of already looking at in various um, programs that we run. Um, as Julia mentioned, a lot of this work has largely been focused towards policy. Um, but we also have had some interest from um, the commercial sector and how this work could be applicable to them. Um, so we're also looking to um, work with industry to try and operationalize the indicator framework um, to see how it could be used to um, assess the risk of destructive fishing across supply chains. Um, and then finally, um, we're also looking at how a just transition could um, support some of this work. Um, so this sort of concept of a just transition is really building momentum within the fishery space, not only looking at decarbonizing the fishing fleet, but also looking at the impact of certain practices on the wider ecosystem. Um, and while this term is used a lot in policy and advocacy asks, there isn't much consensus over sort of what it means, how it should be done, where it should be done and by who. Um, so this is that something that we are looking into with various other NGOs and hopefully sort of widen this up to sort of other sectors such as industry and government to really understand what we mean by a just transition, how this could be used to support um, this work when sort of identifying destructive fishing practices to make sure that there are alternatives offers that alternatives offered that are socially and economically equitable. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief overview of our next steps. Um, we would love to have any questions either from in the room or online on anything that we've discussed today. Um, my email address is also up here if there's any sort of questions later on um, that you'd like to get in contact with. And Jack is gonna do a poll um, online and in the room there are some um, pieces of paper um, with just a few questions on how you think this work could be useful either to you as an individual or as an organization um, which we'd be really grateful to um, if you could fill out um, and Jack's just doing the, the online call right now. Um, but yes thank you very much for joining in the room and online and yeah please if you have any questions online feel free to, to raise your hand or to um, put it in the chat. Um, and yeah, or any questions in the room? Okay, great. Um, so we've got a question online from Emily from Marin Trust. Um, Emily, I don't know if you you want to unmute yourself and and ask your question aloud, otherwise I can um, read it if that's easier. Hi, I'll give it a go. Hopefully, it's not. Um, apologize for some background noise. Uh, thank you so much. It's really interesting and glad you guys reached out and sent us this invitation. Uh, my question was just really around a lot of these indicators are already used in the and the sort of unsustainable um, definitions of fishing, if you were like the MSU fishery standard has quite a lot of those set up um, already in there. Would an activity need to be worse to be destructive um, as you widen this de definition? Or are we really starting to overlap into what's really kind of considered unsustainable? Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, and maybe, yeah, Julian also can, can feed in here as well. But I think that this issue of sort of common terms that are already agreed, like um, overfishing and how destructive fishing sort of is different from that, is this idea of destructive is really the, to the point where something could be irreversible and, um, you know, won't be able to recover, whereas unsustainable is more indicative of something that could be reversed um, with better management put in place. Um, so that's kind of how we are sort of separating those terms and how that sort of came out within the um, workshop that we discussed. Um, but also, as, as Julia was mentioning, this is very much sort of 
intended to be adapted at the, the local or the national scale. So that's sort of what that actually means by sort of long lasting and sort of moving more towards destructive would need to be sort of decided at that, that more sort of local and, and national level. Okay, thanks Emily. Um, Hilario, I don't know if you'd like to unmute to ask your question. Oh, sorry, you just want us to share the presentation. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we recorded this session, Hilario, so we can um, provide you with the presentation and also the recording. That's absolutely fine. Um, question in the room. Hi, um, <coughs> I'm Sunil Han. I'm doing the presentation. Uh, so I have two questions, if that's okay. Uh, first thing to do with what you were just talking about in terms of what separates overfishing from destructive fishing. But in a lot of cases, beyond a certain limit or a threshold, overfishing is likely to become destructive in, this, uh, destructive in its impact. So is there any effort to put that sort of threshold as to what is overfishing and at what point is overfishing itself become destructive, even though it's not, might not be a practice like class fishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And this is something um, we should... Oh, sorry. 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 Yeah, sure. So um, Samir was asking about um, the difference between sort of overfishing and a threshold at which sort of overfishing may become destructive fishing. Um, and this is something that we looked at within the indicator framework and sort of tried to think if we could have this sort of, you know, point at which something becomes destructive. But we just decided it was it was too complicated and too sort of context specific to sort of identify a single point at which something becomes destructive. Um, so this would mu very much be based on the the species, um, the life history, the stock status. All those factors would need to be sort of taken into account to identify that specific threshold. And the purpose of the indicator framework is it's more trying to sort of identify a bit of a, a pattern or an indication that something is heading towards becoming destructive rather than having sort of a a blanket sort of line, whereas over this, this is destructive. But yeah, Judy, I don't know if you have anything else. No. And um, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> especially this is for Julia in terms of um, developing an indicator. I remember you mentioned it's really hard to infer causality, mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to like that's a lot of things. Whether are you group fishing as well? So how can you infer any type of causality when we have a lack of data in who is even fishing there or what kind of fish. Yeah, that's definitely a oh, challenge. Yeah, and also in terms of there's multiple impacts happening at the same time on marine ecosystems, right? So how do you say something is due to fishing or like nutrients or climate change or anything like that is super hard to disentangle. So that's why there have to be kind of indicators along the impact kind of pathways, if that makes sense. So you have those measuring potentially destructive uh, practices um, and how often they're happening and then trying to see the, the overlap with like vul potentially vulnerable ecosystems, et cetera. But um, the distinction with IUU is also a challenging one. And again, there's huge data gaps in terms of what's actually happening there. So a lot of the time, a lot of the frameworks that we looked at that are trying to answer these questions actually are based on kind of expert judgment on the likely uh, occurrence of destructive practices that are not IUU, et cetera. So we're still kind of relying on these judgments in a lot of the cases because there's simply just not the actual evidence um, to measure it directly. But it really depends on, on the location. Like some countries do have better data than others. And this is also something to consider. Hope that answers the question. Um, Peter, I saw you had your hand raised a moment ago. Did you? Was there something you'd like to ask? Do you want to unmute? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, well, so it, I mean, some of the earlier discussion covered it, but I, I wanted to get back to to, to the uh, so, so socioeconomic indicators question, uh, in that you know. Who, who, I may have raised it in an earlier session, but this this kind of this this discussion raised it again. Is using the so, uh, social and economic indicate social and economic data as indicators, but because you know if with the ecological effects or the foundation 
for for the cha- for the chain of destructive fishing or the foundation for the social and economic impacts, not the indicators themselves of destructive fishing. In my mind, anyway, and I'm not an economist, so I clearly respect others who have, have different views. But adding these to the to the to the framework of indicators may, from a from a top down approach, you know, from FAO and the UN, uh, drive nations and their and they're the agencies within to develop the indicators because we keep going through these loops of 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 uh you know of, of global and national uh goals for sustainable fishing that then lack the uh the support to be able to collect those data not that they're not collectible it's just there's not the the, the available funding to be able to do the work and so the you know adding the value social and economic value to the issue that's mostly out of sight out of mind for most people uh may push uh push nations to make these kinds of investments and again the same the, the issues about inference and uh expert opinion on what those drivers are and again they're certainly disentangling climate change and land use practices and and those kinds of things from the actual fishing are problematic but if we don't t- have the drivers to move ahead and disentangle these things. We're just going to be in this en- endless do loop of, uh, of 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 trying to match what our goals to to simply what's available. Hopefully, some of that made sense. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, that's some really great points, and yeah, definitely really interesting to try and sort of incorporate those. Um, criteria and elements of social economic to try and sort of push that in the agenda and, and make that more important. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think there was a question here yeah, in the room. So, hi, my name is Phil. I'm a PhD student in modeling marine protected areas, their effects on biodiversity and fisheries. Um, I was wondering how much time, either so far and maybe in the future, you've spent trying to really put a quantitative angle on your definition, just because, for example, with the definitions that are commonly put out for, say, overfishing, at least the ones that I tend to use in my own work, they're quite quantitative, and so they give you a very simple way of black and white, this system meets the definition. And then also with something like the IUC and Red List, although it's quite patchwork definitions they have for their categories, they are in general, kind of quantitative measures, and so it makes it practically actually very usable. Mm-hmm. So I was just wondering um, if there was any thoughts about moving towards that, or if you've really been exploring that. Um, so for those uh, listening on online, the question was about um, whether we had already or plan to in the future try and incorporate some kind of quantitative element to. A definition. Um, and I think the first part of that is that when we started the project, um, and particularly the um, the expert consultation process, we were very open to um, incorporating something quite quantitative. And in fact, you know, it might have been nice if that was possible. But what came out really early on was that there are so many varied potential definitions and things that could be included that could have a quantitative element that we it became apparent that we almost just had to take a step back and even focus on like what is the concept of it um what is how does it relate to other fisheries concepts so we we took that approach because of um because of the way particularly the first round of of the expert consultation process developed. Um, There's not really a scope within this project because we are uh, finishing up uh, for the most part at the moment, but I think whether that uh, quantitative element comes through an indicator framework um, or um, potentially in a definition if if one is developed down the line, um, I think there are there's certainly circumstances where it would be extremely useful, and I think your modeling work is probably <laughs> one of those areas. Um, but yeah, we, as part of this project, we realized fairly early on that we had to take a step back because there was um, the term destructive fishing was still so broad um, that 
I guess it wasn't, we weren't ready as a, as a very, not just a project team, but as a much wider group of people interested in fisheries, um, we're not ready to actually put those quantitative elements into it yet. Yeah, thanks, Ali. I also just wanted to add, I suppose, the, our framework has been designed to try and be as applicable as possible in all different contexts. And I, so I suppose in more to limited fisheries for them to try and sort of collect that quantitative data or sort of understand the what's needed to reach those thresholds might be a bit more complicated and we try to sort of allow for more qualitative data or at least qualitative indicators to try and sort of combat some of that sort of requirement. Cool. Uh, we've got a question online by from Dan. Dan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Dan Stebman. I used to work at Fauna and Flora and um, I'm part of the reason that this whole show <laughs> got on the road. So it's absolutely fantastic to see the work that Hannah and Jack and everyone have done taking it forward um, and particularly seeing that indicator framework evolve is very exciting. So kudos to you all. Um, one of the reasons that, that Chris McCohen and I and others sort of started this project was uh, a frustration with the fact that this term exists and has existed for a very long time and is written into all of these global pledges. So in a sense, all the world's governments have already signed up to doing this, to dealing with destructive fishing, to at least seeing it reduced, if not ended. And I wondered with having got as far as you have through the project, if you were faced with a policymaker who said, right, I'm going to make it my, my number one mission in my EZ to end destructive fishing, what what do you think your indicator framework and the project would would tell them to do? What would be the the three or four headline policy actions that you would want to see completed in order to show that you were compliant with that with the this emerging definition of what destructive fishing is? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the tough question. Um, uh, <laughs> Should have expected it, really. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I thought you were going to answer some questions for us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so sorry, Dan. So in terms of, you know, what would we ask as our, our policy ask for a country trying to incorporate this, this definition? Or I guess what, do, you know, what does, uh, what does ending destructive fishing look like? What, how, how do you know when you're there? What would, what would be some of your signifiers, you think, of a state that had actually complied with all of these various global commitments and, and had reduced or ended destructive fishing? Yeah, thanks, Dan. And, you know, as we've kind of been saying along, this is all very sort of context specific and trying to understand, um, you know, the issue of baselines and sort of where are you starting, where do you want to get back to? Um, and this was actually a bit of a feedback that we had about using the word um, irreversible and, you know, what are we actually trying to reverse back to um, and how do you quantify that? So I think some of those issues of, you know, what do we want this to look like are still largely sort of um, things for us to work on and, and further define. Um, and I think this is where also we're trying to bring in this aspect of a just transition. Um, so, you know, not just looking at trying to reverse the, the biodiversity or the sort of ecosystem degradation, but trying to bring in these sort of socioeconomic aspects um, so that, you know, people can continue to fish, but in a more sustainable way rather than sort of, you know, trying to bring in sort of blanket bounds on certain gear types or, or certain practices. Um, but really trying to understand how you can sort of have a more of a a win-win situation. I suppose if I'm honest, I don't know if I have a three or four key things of exactly what it would look like. Um, I think at this moment, and but I we have had some interest to try and sort of from various um, nations to try and sort of build on this uh, definition and build on the indicator framework and really understand what that would mean sort of in practice on the ground um, at a sort of more local and, and national level. Um, so yeah, sorry, Dan, I don't know if I can fully answer your question. I don't know if anyone else has any. Um... <laughs> We're just getting shaking heads in the room, Dan, I think it was, uh... yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose I don't know if you'd thought when you sort of envisioned this project, if you had any sort of end, end points in your mind or you and Chris's mind when you were sort of thinking of this work. Good to know that you've become a deft project manager in uh, <laughs> flipping the question back to me. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I think for for me, the motivation of the project was um, thinking that overfishing already exists as a fairly well defined concept. And I think you're starting to get a fairly collective understanding that overfishing doesn't just mean 
the status of the target species. It also means the things that the target species is connected to in the ecosystem. And, you know, you're starting to see RFMOs and things managing, investigating managing fisheries, not just according to the health of the target species, but according to the health of the ecosystem and dependent predators and um, the status of bycatch species. But where I think there's a, you know, continues to be a massive gap is in, you know, costing the full effect of fisheries that that damage ecosystems and I you know I would use the word irreversible I think I think that is a, a viable word to use in in some of the um, instances that are being described by the project so I think there's a long way to go to show that fisheries are non-destructive through a kind of um, you know management lens so um, yeah, I, I I would also find it hard to kind of pitch to someone, but I think if they if if a, a given fisheries manager says all my stocks are at MSY and I'm I've got control of bycatch, that that to me that's not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's something that you know in terms of ecosystem function and structure, which are also you know largely ambiguous terms in themselves. It's really about that sort of wider interaction between those different aspects of the the ecosystem um, that we just don't necessarily have that information yet all those sort of indicators available to to measure that interaction and i guess that's where being precautionary comes in right because the yeah. word precautionary often sits alongside the word destructive or the word ecosystem approach in a lot of these frameworks so if mm. we don't know and if we can't quantify the impact that doesn't mean do nothing yeah. it means pause and review mm -hmm. um, so yeah anyway great session thank you so much Thanks, Dan. And yeah, thanks everyone in the room and online for joining. We'll wrap it up there because I think we've just gone over time. Um, but yeah, we will be circulating the presentation um, and please don't hesitate to get in touch um, if you have any other follow up questions or want to discuss anything more about destructive fishing. Um, but thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining.